Hi, it's Kerner Tex here again with the third part in the series of building Beyond Linux from Scratch. Now if you remember from the previous video, we'd um, spent a big session installing the libraries and programs to get Xorg working to allow us to have a X Windows interface or GUI which is the standard GUI for Linux. So today what we've got to do is just tidy a few things up. There's a few tweaks and adjustments to make for Xorg. Um, we've got to rebuild OpenSSH uh, because that had an optional, optional dependency on um, X Windows. Um, also, I'm going to delete these two snapshots because they're taking up disk space that's unnecessary. Each each snapshot stores a um, data that's different from the previous snapshot or the current state, so that's just taking up unneeded space now. Um, we took those snapshots because of the fact that the Java um, program seems to cause um, segmentation faults and it's a bit hit and miss as and when it does that so that was just to protect us um, rather than have to rebuild from scratch it enabled us to reboot the machine at that that moment in time and um, continue the build where it where it broke or just before where it broke um, then for the rest of this uh, video plan on just getting um, a web browser installed um, and then, then from that point on we'll be able to install the rest of the software I've, I've got planned to install completely within the new um, LFS and BLFS environment that we've built up so far. So as I say got a few things to tidy up. I'm going to start off with these two snapshots you can see they were created 17 hours ago so all you can do on here is just delete them it says are you sure you want to delete it yes so it deletes the uh, changes that are made on the disk and it's removed and I can do the same thing with snapshot 2 just delete it And it looks like it's actually merging the changes from that snapshot into the current state. reason why this is probably taking a lot longer than the first snapshot was because there was only a few changes there's only like a command or two between the first and second snapshot uh, a few commands whereas this snapshot in the current state would be all the other packages we installed since we took this snapshot which was um, quite a bit of data so I just wait for this to complete Okay, that's done. So what I'll do is I'll start this virtual machine off. Okay, so we don't need to log in or anything here. Um, can do actually I will do like I was doing yesterday with the leaving top up in case I wanted to um, see what the system is doing so I'll just minimize this into the background and we'll go to the local um, terminal on the host machine and SSH uh, into 
the virtual machine we've got running as the BLFS user. Okay, so let's change to sources and into BLFS. So the first thing we'll do is we're just going to look at, as I say, just a few little tweaks and changes to make. <clears throat> um, so we've got a virtual um, graphics card. I, I don't exactly know what the capabilities are. Um, we have got 3D acceleration enabled. 2D acceleration is not enabled. I can't remember why that, that's not allowed, but it's not recommended when you um, create the virtual machine in VirtualBox. So there are limitations. Um, there's a chance that things like this DRI is not installed or not working, but the emulation is good enough that it's, it's reasonably fast. You probably wouldn't be able to play a... Um, full-blown video game on it but it's it's fast enough for our purposes so we can um, optionally do this just to check to see if DRI is enabled or not probably not DRI 2 but maybe DRI so if we look at the log file for the current running session which is there at the moment. Oh, that says. Oh, yes. This will be the previous log file, of course, because we haven't run it today. So, if we grep for DRI in capitals on that file, we can see it says it's initializing DRI three, but it says screen zero is not DRI two capable. Um, but it says it's actually initializing the extension DRI and DRI two. So, there's a possibility that. Um, it is DRI capable. Um, another way we can look at this is if we go to VI, we can just search for DRI and see what the messages are below. Okay, so it actually does say DRI, not DRI, too compatible there or, or capable. That just says it's trying to initialize the extensions. There's nothing else. There's no real indication that it is compatible or not, or, or sorry, whether it's um, actually enabled or not. Um, what we can do, though, is we can use the, if you remember when we installed Mesa in the previous video, we ran a patch in that um, allowed two demo files to be installed to show the OpenGL capabilities of the graphics card. So we can run both of them. Um, the first one, GLX info just uh, okay right yeah we can't do it at this terminal because it hasn't got an X display so what I'll have to do is go to the real um, terminal start just type in star text to start the GUI okay now I've noticed this this is another anomaly that seems to happen with the um, virtual box video driver when it first starts it seems to start up in this sort of minimized format but if you exit, remember this is the login X term. So if we exit on that one to shut the GUI down and restart it, it initializes it full screen. So it's a, a slight anomaly there. So let's just move these around a little bit. Um, yeah, if we type that command that I mentioned, GLX info, it will display all the capabilities. If I just scroll up. In fact, it might be easier if I do that command again and pipe it through uh, less. So we've got information here, name of the display is zero. That's a sort of standard default uh, display number. Uh, screen zero. So it actually says direct rendering is enabled there. So it is the DRA is actually active. And then we've got um, it's displaying what extent GLX extensions are active. Um, we've got a vendor string, so it shows us the Mesa package and the um, GL version, which is 1.4. It's quite an old version. So um, any acceleration is available. Probably, probably won't be doing much. Um, there's some more information there. 
that looks like it's trying to use the um, certainly not um, an eight gigabyte video card um, when we set this up in VirtualBox, I think it was defaulted to 16 megabytes. So that that looks like it's got access to the main memory because we've got eight gig of main memory. Um, and it just shows some other version numbers there. So we've got, um, I, th I think that's embedded. I can't remember what the GLES stands for, but we've got version 1.1 .1 and version 3. And the OpenGL vendor string VMware and so on. So just list more capabilities there. Okay, so it looks like we've got capability of OpenGL version 3 there actually. And all the functions that are available. And then we've got the various um, I think these are the video modes and the geometry that's available and the number of colors and so on. So if you were a programmer of sorts that dealt with video then I'm sure this would make a lot more sense than it does to me. <laughs> okay, the other test we can use, the other sample program that was installed was something called GLX Gears which is a simple um, animation using OpenGL and it also shows us how many frames per second um, it's managing to render this animation this simple animation in so the first one was slow because I paused it when I dragged the window and obviously if we make this window bigger the um, the overall frame rate will go down because it's it's doing a lot more work. You can see it's dropped quite a bit already. So it's about a quarter of what it was, probably because it's uh, four times the size now. If you are building this um, BLFS on a real system with a proper graphics card with real hardware acceleration, I doubt very much if you'd find any um, very little difference in frames per second by enlarging the screen. Uh, this is such a simple rendering. I think that we've got such a huge drop because it's a software renderer that's um, active at the moment. Okay, so yes, there's something else I should mention actually. With the, I didn't mention it yesterday with this TWM window manager. Is if you know when I move the cursor across the windows the focus changes immediately so you don't click on these windows to get the focus you move the mouse over the window and that's what gets the focus so if you can see the title bar of this X-term window is like a sort of hashing like a grey greyish blue hashing as soon as I move the cursor over to the one on the left that's the one that's gained focus and you can see by the colour of the cursor the cursor has gone solid one to show that the this window is the one with the focus and again, if I move it over here, you see the one on the cursor on the left has gone to a box showing that it's lost focus. And again, the title bar has got this hashing and the cursor has gone uh, black on this one. So when I had GLX gears up just now, I tried to pause it by pressing or stop it by pressing escape. But I had my cursor over this window as I have now. And it was sending the escape character from the keyboard to that window and not to the app. So to to actually shut down the app, I've got to move the cursor over the app. You see it's become active. I've got this hashing. And now I press escape and that closes it down. And by doing that escape, it seems that I've uh, tried to do something here. So I do know there. So that, that shows that the GL subsystem's working. So I'll quit this for now, minimize this terminal and we'll go back to the host console with the SSH session that we've um, connected, we connect with, that we're connected to our BLFS system with. Um, there's a bit here about if you've got a video card with hardware acceleration acceleration that can do DRI2 
um, to add the user to the and, and you've got console kit to installed to add the user that um, wants to access the GUI um, to act, uh, actually add them to the video group so it's not going to be necessary in our case but I'll do it anyway because you know if you did this on a real machine and your video card isn't capable at the moment you might upgrade it at a future time um, where it has this capability so it's probably good preparation for that that situation so let's put that command in so we're going to add the BLFS user to the video group so we can just check the groups that BLFS is in but right okay that's got to be done as sudo no, it's because I spelled it wrong. <laughs> right, there you go. So that's been added uh, to the BLFS user. But of course, if I do groups as the BLFS user, it doesn't show that video group there because we need to re-log in. So let's do that now. So now if I do groups, yeah, it's activated the um, user with video group so let's go back to the BLFS directory and it actually says here about running GLX info and looking for this information here to show if DRI is working properly which we've already seen and also it shows here something else we saw that um, the OpenGL renderer is is actually using the software rasterizer so that is why that um, frame rate went down quite a lot when we enlarged the window when the GLX gears were being displayed but that's not a problem it's uh, as I say it's going to be quite adequate for what what we're going to do here on demonstration in this um, virtual environment on a, a real machine then yeah you you'd likely if you didn't have something like the NVIDIA card or a Radeon card, you'd, you'd have more than likely have the Intel um, graphics ch uh, chip, which is built into the processor, the central processing unit, um, which has uh, quite a capable acceleration. There's a bit here about hybrid graphics. If uh, I think they're mostly on laptops, those sort of graphics. So we'll skip past that. Uh, now into a bit about setting up Xorg devices. In the past, with um, X Windows, you'd have to create by hand um, an Xorg.conf file which describes the display you've got, the graphics adapter, the keyboard. Um, you'd have to type in some mode setting details, which were the um, parameters for the um, resolution and color depth of the um, video mode that you want selected and it was quite a complex thing to create especially if you've never done it before now it's all automated um, and it's actually um, frowned upon that you create this file it's it's something where you you, you just want to rely on the automatic detection of um, X Windows booting up or Xorg um, but there are some exceptions um, if you find something a bit peculiar about your hardware is not working or you need to um, add in some functionality that's that's the only time that it's recommended that you actually um, create these config files and one case where you would need to, to add, create a config file for Xorg is this bit here for input devices especially if you're not using a US QWERTY keyboard which is the default keyboard um, I don't know if you noticed I tried to pipe uh, let's go back into this graphical system I tried to pipe uh, the output of the log through less right that's actually gone um, when I press the pipe symbol on my keyboard I get the right hand chevron because I'm using a UK keyboard and obviously where my pipe symbol is is where the uh, right hand chevron is on the US QWERTY keyboard so I need to create this file to um, tell XORG to remap my keyboard 
as a UK keyboard. An example I've given here is to remap it as a French keyboard. And obviously, whatever keyboard you're using, you'll need to adjust this code here to reflect the um, keyboard layout that you're using. So I'm going to run this in here and then edit it and change the keyboard type from French to um, what do I type in here? I think it's trouble with the UK. Sometimes it's UK you put in, and sometimes it's GB, and sometimes it's ENGB, and it changes. So um, I've just got to check my notes to see what right it's GB for this. So insert GB and save and exit come out of root. So I'm going to go back to my real virtual terminal, if that makes sense. Start the GUI up again and I'm going to type my pipe symbol and it's working correctly now. And I've checked the pound sign is where it should be, it is. And the at sign is another one as well as the double quotes. So that's all fine. Okay. Then there's a section on fine-tuning display settings. As I say, normally you, you wouldn't need to do this. The auto detection works perfectly well, but um, if you've got multiple screens, um, you'd want to do this and so on. But uh, I'm not going to do that in this, this, this example. So the next bit we've got is tuning font config. <coughs> and this is all about... Um, the fonts and uh, how they're configured and how you add fonts to the font cache and so on. There's a bit here about hinting and anti-aliasing to improve the appearance of fonts. Um, yeah, we're going to be installing uh, KDE or Plasma 5 um, and as it says here they can override these changes but let's put this in because we won't be using that for a well, towards the end, I'm not not planning to do that until the near the end. So, as we'll be using other window managers in the meantime, this this having this configuration may well improve the um, appearance of the uh, images that appear on the screen. So, let's become root again and paste this in. And there's some. Uh, defaults that they've put in here so I'm not going to change anything in there but it says you can edit it with your preferred editor. Um, another one we'll do is disabling bitmap fonts. Fonts, They're the original fonts that we used and they're, they are quite ugly. They're um, not very nice to look at so we'll put that in in case they appear. And then there's a bit about adding in extra font directory as we saw yesterday we did this with uh, the Deja View fonts when we um, downloaded them and um, uh, ran the font cache the font config cache on them so if I can remember where they are I think it's a user share is it fonts fonts config, I can't remember which one it is now. Yeah, it's fonts. So user share fonts. There's that Deja Vu uh, folder we created yesterday. And there's those fonts that we copied in there. So this is explaining how you can add in other fonts. There's also a bit here it says if you've got text live installed, which we haven't at the moment, but I do plan on um, demonstrating that the installation of this package it's showing how you can include the fonts that are with that package which aren't underneath this user share fonts directory you can see they're actually text live has been installed into the op directory but it's showing how we can reference the fonts that are underneath this hierarchy instead of the user share fonts hierarchy so we'll add that in although they're not there at the moment it won't do any harm to have that ready and waiting for when we do install text live Um, 
and then there's a bit here about preferring specific fonts so it says as an example if for some reason you wish to use the Nimbus Roman number 9 L font wherever Times New Roman is preferred it's metrically similar and preferred for the Ro Times Roman but the serif font from Liberation fonts are preferred for the Times New Roman font if installed as an individual user you could install the font and create the following file so it just shows how you can um, reconfigure the preferences for certain fonts so I won't be doing that I won't I won't put that in then if you're using Chinese Japanese and Korean fonts there's a lot of information there about how to um, deal with those and some more links for further information from the arch and gen 2 wikis so I move on to the next section which is to do with TTF and OTF fonts um, give some explanation all about that and you may recognize this is where we were yesterday because it's got the example for installing the Deja Vu fonts which we did with this link here that's under this hyperlink here so if you wish to install other fonts you can download them with all these external links and um, install them in a similar way to how Deja Vu was installed so basically it's creating an that, that, in, that command is creating a directory for the fonts that command copies the TTF or OTF fonts that you've downloaded obviously that will have to change depending on um, whereabouts the, the fonts are and finally you update the font cache font config cache with that command there so you obviously put in the, the directory of the font that you're, you've created up here to add that in. I can't remember if we do actually install any other fonts on the way but um, there's like I say lots of links there so that's more or less it the next bit XORG legacy fonts we have already installed as part of the procedure for installing legacy we can just check that you see it's creating a legacy.dat file and it's creating a legacy directory so if we look in the xc directory for legacy.dat well in fact there you go there's the legacy file uh, directory there's the legacy.dat and there's the checksum for it as well so it just shows that we've we've been through all this so that's the xorg system completed so what I'm going to do now is go back to OpenSSH and just reinstall this just to take into consideration the fact that we've got an X Windows system installed and being as an option for SSH why not reinstall SSH and uh, take advantage of anything um, it may give us or it, you know extra functionality it may give us by having the X Windows also notice um, the Java development kit is one of the optional runtime uh, benefits as well so all dependencies rather so that could be quite useful so let's extract open SSH again so the first bit is about creating a directory a user and a group for open SSH we don't need to do that because it's already there so we'll run the patch in can't remember if there's any yes there is some because there's PEM isn't there we need to specify so let's copy that much copy the with PAM parameter make sure that's still enabled now we can add in this with XAuth switch that's the bit we didn't have before Kerberos I'm not using and with libedit and it was line editing feature line editing and history features for SFTP so I can't remember if that's a yes this is a separate external library which I'm not going to install so we'll ignore that switch so let's run that configuration configuring Uh, 
Okay, let's just check what we've got here. Um, doesn't look like there's anything confirming that we've got uh, any sort of X window stuff that's been rec oh unrecognized option. Ah, oh, right. Okay, that's why I've did, I haven't put a space between the two switches. So I didn't see that. So let's run rerun the. Don't need to rerun the patch again. That's already been done, so that will fail. Let's just rerun the configure. Okay, so we haven't got any errors this time. Yeah, I can't really see anything that proves that it's picked that up, but at least it's not complained about the um, fact that uh, the switches were in error last time. So let's um, let's just run make now. Okay, that's done. So let's install it all again, including the documentation um, as the root user, of course. Okay. So let's check that we've still got this permit permit root login no set. So still as the root user. Yeah, it's still there, and we've also still got the use PAM yes set as well, so that's good. And we don't need to install the boot script because that will already be there. Um, let's just check this file here. Yeah, that's okay. And that one there as well. Yep. That looks okay. So what we need to do now is to restart the SSH server. Uh, sorry, the daemon. So let's uh, go to init.d sshd restart. It's okay. And let us now check, I didn't check this yesterday, but let's make sure that the root user can't log in. It's okay. So what I'm going to do is start a new tab up and try and SSH into our PLFS machine as the root. So it's connected. I'm going to type the root password in thinks about it and yes it's refusing that's how it refuses it silently refuses so it's good from a security point of view the hacker doesn't know whether it's whether it's putting the right password uh, the wrong password in sorry or if root access is actually being denied so it's left in the dark basically so I'll try one more time and it should time out I think after the third attempt yeah it's well it's actually asking us again but with a different message Yeah, it's it's not having it. And we'll just check we can get in there again with BLFS. And yeah, that's fine. So that's all okay. So come out of root, go back and tidy up, open SSH. 
So it's done. So I'll go back to the contents and we're now going to start to install a web browser. I passed the note. Yep, here it is. Now initially when I was testing this I built Falcon um, thinking it was a relatively simple web browser and it turned out to be far from that um, and also it seemed to be quite well it was quite sluggish to use and I think I don't think it was anything to do with the compile itself I think it's quite heavy on the graphics um, so it looks like it needs a um, a properly accelerated graphics card so I'm not going to install that because of that reason it was um, a bit um, almost unbearable to use it was it was that sluggish um, I'm going to install Firefox at a later later time and for now I'm going to install CMonkey um, it's a reasonably sized browser um, and you'll also see that all the work we did yesterday in the previous video is uh, going to come to fruition now there's a lot of packages that CMonkey needs that we've already installed there's just a few extra ones we need to store about, uh, about a half dozen or so, I think. So let's get that ready in another tab. And you can see it's an open source sibling of Netscape. And follow on from the Mozilla browser suite. Um, yeah, it says about uh, sub projects Firefox and Thunderbird. Thunderbird, so I'm going to be building both of those, which are also based on the Mozilla source code. So let's take a look at the dependencies. Um, I've actually stopped keeping my list of uh, packages we installed. I found it a bit too onerous. I've never done it before. I thought it would work quite well, and it didn't in the end. So um, I think having something on the host machine would have been easier to tick off. Um, so I'm going to try and hopefully either remember or be able to check what packages we've already installed um, and hopefully we won't uh, miss anything so autoconf 2.3 I'm pretty sure we did that yesterday so we can just check that we've downloaded it yes and there's a patch there gtk 2 and 3 we've got unzip we've got that I'm sure yeah Yasm we did and zip we did so all the requirements are there let's check the recommended ICU 631 we've got lib event I don't think we had that one no so lib event we need lib VPX no let's do a search in case it's in the um, one of the subdirectories No, okay, so we need that one. Um, NSPR we did. NSS we did. Pulse Audio, I don't think we did that one. No, so we need that one. And SQLite, we've got that one as well. So it's saying, again, if you don't install the recommended dependencies, then internal copies of the packages will be used. They might be tested to work, but they can be out of date and contain security holes. So we'll ignore the optionals and let's go through these dependencies, see what they need. So Pulse Audio needs lib sound files. So I don't think we got that. I don't think we hardly installed any sound related stuff yesterday, maybe one or two. So we need that one. Also lib we did. Yeah. Dbus we got as well, because that's running as a service or a daemon um, glib we've got let's check these again libcap not sure about that one no we haven't got that one with pam as well so we've got pam that's okay speaks we haven't got xor blog is we have okay so let's go to the end of this one speaks requires libog 
which we've got. Yeah, and Vow Grind, which I'm not going to install, don't need that. So let's start with Speaks then. So, same process as before, we grab the packages, additional package information, let's get that. Right, so it's saying that the two separate tables we've downloaded, they need to be extracted and built independently. So we'll be installing the speaks first, the actual package itself. So let's extract that one. Okay, so. usual disable static in both of them and then there's an enable binaries which builds two binaries to encode and decode to and from the speaks format but it doesn't say which package that belongs to so we'll try and put it in on both of them and I guess if it's not acceptable by by either of the packages it will refuse it or ignore it one of the two so let's see if the first one takes it <coughs> Well, yeah, it seems to have uh, not disliked it, so let's compile that and let's just see. It could be these two here, it's built Speaks, Deck, and Ink. That could be what those that switch has done. So let's install it. That's done. And remove uh, the source. And now we'll do the other one. Speaks SP. Speaks DSP, sorry. And we'll do the same with this. We'll copy this and add in the enable binary switch. Right, okay, so it looks like that was only for the first package. Uh, let's remove that just in case. Although it is a warning, it should be Oh, hang on. I did extra commands there. Let's start again. I forgot to remove the uh, commands at the top here. Oh, wait a minute. This is actually... Yeah, I see what this is doing now. This is um, This should have been run from the speaks directory, which of course is what you'd expect because we've not been told to change directory from the place we install speaks from so let's see we need to delete that DSP okay let me just check what's happened above Right, it doesn't look like it's created anything there, so that's okay because there was a CD dot dot there, so. Right, so what we need to do is let's just um, extract speaks again, change into it, and then we can now run this as it is. That's better. And now we can install it. Um, 
Okay, that's done. So I'm guessing we're going to have two directories to get rid of now, yep. So it'll be the speaks package and the speaks DSP. Okay, they're gone. So that's that one. So now we've got libcap 2.26 with PAM. We've got PAM installed as a requirement. So let's just extract. No, sorry, fetch it and then extract it. So run the make command and then install it. And that's done. So libs sound file needs flack, <coughs> excuse me, which we haven't got. Libog and libforbis we have. Libog and libforbis. So let's go to flack now. So flack needs libog we've got, nasm we've got, let's check though, just to be sure. Dot we oh sorry these are all optional anyway, but um we haven't got these these three actually, so that's not a problem. We can just fire away with flack. So there's only a, an explanation of one of the existing switches, so we'll just copy the configure and make command as it is. Okay, so let's install that now. That's done. So, lib sound file. Let's fetch this one. And there's no additional switches, so we'll just copy and paste that. And let's install it. So now we're going to pulse audio. So let's grab that. So let's have a look at this. Um, two disable blues commands we've got. I think blues is for Bluetooth, which we haven't got on this virtual machine, so that's okay. Disable our path, prevents a link from running a hard code, hard code is runtime path. Okay, so we can just copy this as it is.
Right, so we can install it. remove a config file for the dbus so it says configuration is system wide and per user configuration files which take preference over system wide ones default configuration files allow setting up a working installation however a reference to console kit needs to be removed if it is not installed right so we have got console kit let's check that or have we? Perhaps we haven't. Oh, um, we're in Pulse Audio, that's why. Oh, I thought we'd installed that. Um, do we need it? Let's see where that is. Yes, I think we'll be installing this at some point actually. So we will. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to leave that in there. I'm pretty sure we install um, one of the um, desktop environments that requires console kit so I won't put that in there which will remove a reference to it because it says the reference needs to be removed if it's not installed if we're going to um, have it installed at a later time um, so you may also have to configure the audio system I'm not too bothered about getting the audio work working for this, this demonstration if it works it works if it doesn't not particularly bothered um, it's more about getting the graphical front end working because that enables us to work within the system itself and to have actual apps working and um, you know programs working. So that's that's more important uh, to me for this for this situation. Uh, so I think we can say that one's completed. So libvpx next, this needs Yasm, so it's compiling with Yasm is currently broken so either it will pick up Yasm automatically or we'll need to give it a switch so that it doesn't try to use Yasm. Um, apart from that we've got the requirements so let's grab it. Okay, so let's see what switches we've got. Disable VP8, disable VP9. So there's no switches to specify that we need Yasm. So I'm assuming it will just pick it up. Yeah, it says using Yasm there. It's just scrolled up the screen. Yeah, there it is there. So that's that's okay.
Right, that's done, so we shall install that now. That's it. So now we're going to live event. That's only got an optional dependency of Doxygen, which we haven't got, so that's okay. Fetch the package, extract it, and build it. There's no extra config options. Now we can install it. And that's it. There's no API documentation to install, so that's complete. So, as looks like we're already on CMonk, as I say, there's um, a lot of these packages were already installed in the previous video so a lot of the work has been done and um, find this from now on the, the packages we inst install there like the app packages there the dependencies are most mostly there not all of them but um, a good good section of them are there so let's get this browser source which is 220 megabytes so it'll take a couple of minutes to download or a minute or so and it says to note here that although the package name is cmonkey2494 it'll untar to cmon sorry although it's cmonkey2.49.4.source it'll unpack to cmonkey2.49.4 without the source so that's good that's good so we'll unpack that and we'll unpack the other source Okay, so we'll extract that. change into the directory. So it says here the configuration of CMonkey is accomplished by creating a MOZ config file containing desired configuration options and default one is created below. See the entire list of available configuration configuration options and an abbreviated description of each one you can do configure dash dash help. You might wish to review the entire file and comment any desired any other desired options. So let's copy this in and then we'll go and look at each option inspect it manually and see if there's anything we need to change so vi was config and let's just read the comments and see what happens so it says if you have a multi-core machine all cores will be used by default so this option is just to reduce or alter the number of cores so we'll leave that if you have d installed dbus glib comment out this line Now dbus glib, is that an optional one? I thought that was one we had. Dbus is optional. I think I'm tempted to install that, you know. Let's get a new tab up and 
get in with a new session. No, we haven't. I think that's one that we may need to install later on. So, got DBus and GDB. Yeah, let's install that now before we go any further. So, tar, DBus, GDB. So we can just copy it and install this. So that's installed. Let's go back to our original Moz config. So it says if you installed DBus GLib, comment out, comment out this line. So we have, so we'll comment it out. If you have installed DBus GLib and you've installed or will install wireless tools and you wish to use geolocation, comment out this line. We're not installing anything wireless, so we'll leave that option in. Uncomment these lines if you have installed optional dependencies, enable system hand spell and startup notification. I know that the startup notification is a useful one to have and I think we install hand spell for I think it's LibreOffice. So I'll take it these are optional. Yeah, there's startup will install oh hand spells off. BLFS, so we won't install that one, but I will install startup notification. So we've got XORG libraries, I think this was part of the X installation, but let's just search for that. So XCBUtil, there it is there, so we've got that as well. So let's install this one. So nice and simple again. Just copy that. And install it. So that's done. And we'll go back to the Moz config. So uncomment these lines if you installed optional dependency. We haven't got hand spell, so we leave that, but we've now got startup notification so we can remove the comment character from that. <clears throat> so next one, uncomment the following option if you have not installed pulse audio. We have, so we don't disable it and uncomment this option if you've installed Alsalib instead of Pulse Audio. Well, we've got Alsalib as well, as in, rather than instead of. So it looks like Pulse Audio is preferred um, because it's saying you enable Alsa if you haven't got Pulse Audio. So we'll leave that un uh, commented out as well. Comment out the following option if you have gconf installed. Not sure about that one. Looks like we haven't, and I think that is another one that we will be installing. Uh, gconf. So let's install that now. And this G Dbus glib and libxml we've got, and I think we've got these. Let's check them. So dbus glib we just did, yep. Yeah. xml 2 we've got gobject introspection, we've got gtk plus 3 we've got 
and pole kit we've got. So that's fine, that's ready to go. Let's fetch it. Notice the file names in capital G, GC in fact. So we've got disable orbit as a command. Orbit 2 is a deprecated package, so that's why we're not building that static and the documentation. So we can just copy that as it is. And now we can install it. Okay. Let's go back to the mods config and it says comment out the following option if you have gconf installed. Yes, we do have it installed now. So let's put a hash in there. Get rid of that. So next section, comment out the following options if you've not installed the recommended dep dependencies. So these are recommended, so we should have all of these. So SQLite, we've got that. LibEvent, we just installed. LibVPX, we just installed. And these ones we installed earlier in the previous video. So that's fine. And then it says the BLFS editors, rec editors recommend not changing anything below this line. So we'll just accept what's there. So let's save that, escape colon and X, save and exit. Um, what I tend to do here as well, in case I want to, probably more me tweaking, changing things around, is I just create a copy of uh, the MOS config file, either in case I want, you know, maybe it crashes and I've not done something right, uh, or I want to go back and tweak one of the options. I'll take a copy of this because it's in this cmonkey file if we, it, uh, sorry, cmonkey directory. If we delete the directory to re-extract it and start the build from scratch again, we're going to lose this config option. So I'll just back it up into the BLFS directory so it's there to be used another time if, if, if that's required. So cpmos config, I'll copy it to the BLFS directory and I'm going to call it mos config dash c monkey I could even put the version number in here if I wanted to but I think it will make sense as it is let's just check that's there yep there it is there 2292 bytes so let me check the current directory was config 2292 bytes so that's okay So now we, oh, uh, let's read this note. If you're compiling CMonkey and Truth, which we're not, so we can ignore that. Compile CMonkey by running the following commands. And it says the CC and CXX variables are only needed if the, only needed if LLVM is installed, which it is. If using CLang is desired, do not use the C flags or CXX flags above. We've got LLVM installed, so just going to take that as it is and I think this takes a while to build approximately an hour or so so we'll come back when it's complete
Okay, so that's built successfully. Um, so now we can install it. Okay, set compilation flags back to the original values. We weren't using C flags and CXX flags anyway, but in case you're using them for optimizations. If you want to install the full CMonkey development environment as a root user, so I don't think we need to do that because um, we're not interested in anything to do with development. And there's a bit here about configuring CMonkey plugins and configuration parameters. This is if you use a desktop environment like GNOME or KDE, you may wish to create a CMonkey desktop file so that CMonkey appears in the panel's menus. Um, if you didn't enable startup notification in your MozConfig, change the startup line to false. So we will be installing KDE, so let's do this now so it's there ready. And we did enable startup notification, so we just leave that startup notify to true. Paste that in. So that's done. Now, in theory, we're in a situation where let's just tidy this up, where we can do everything else. From within the virtual machine, rather having rather than having to SSH into the machine. So let's start up the graphical environment on the virtual terminal and just move these around. Um, let's start it up down here. So let's type C monkey and press enter. Now what happens when you start a new window, as you can see you get the a grid come up. Um, so the idea is that you position this wherever you want it to appear um, in the, on the screen and then you just left click when you're happy with its location and as you can see the CMonkey window has appeared. It's found that it's the first time we've run this and it's asking us what we want, what it wants to be the default client for. So it's got email and browser. Well, we're not going to have anything to do with email, so we'll leave that unchecked and click OK. So let's just shrink this down a little bit. Put this over here. Just actually stretching it there. So um, you can see it's loaded a page off the web already because it's gone to the World Wide Web. Um, so let's load up Linux from scratch website. Yep, that's found it. Let's go to BLFS read online and get the book up and there you go and we can highlight and middle click to paste so that that all works so that's that um, I think that'll be it for this video um, the next video I'll be um, showing you how to uh, build and install um, a couple of um, desktop managers um, and then moving on to some window managers and some desktop environments. 
before we start building any more apps. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and uh, see you on the next video. Goodbye.